If someone told you to wait in safety while they checked out a potentially dangerous situation, what would you do? It's a question to consider. Here's another question. What are scouts of an army supposed to do? They find out if there's danger and report back to the main body. At least that's one of their jobs, right? Well, a situation unfolded near New Market Gap on May 13th, 1864. And both of those scenarios were ones that maybe should have been considered. I'm Sarah K. Byerly with Gazette 66.5, and today we are talking about Colonel Boyd, Colonel Moore, General Imboden, and the opening skirmishes that set the stage for the Battle of Newmarket. Did you catch last week's video? It was about how the Union and Confederate armies got to Newmarket and some of the com campaign struggles along the way. Now there was one part that we kind of glossed over because we didn't have time. I wanted to be able to do a full video on the May 13th and 14th fighting that occurred near Newmarket. Now if you did watch that video, you'll remember that Franz Siegel and his Union army had been having trouble. Their wagon trains kept getting raided by John Mosby and John McNeil and those guys partisan rangers. That wasn't such a good situation, and Siegel was trying to figure out what to do. One of his efforts was to send out Union cavalry to try to apprehend these rebel raiders. One of the detachments that he sent out was 300 men from the 1st New York Lincoln Cavalry. They were sent out under the command of Colonel William Boyd. Their objective was to enter Luray Valley and make sure that there weren't any Confederates hanging out in there and waiting to surprise Siegel. Luray Valley. It's a place that I've mentioned in videos, but it's been a little while, so here's the quick refresher course. Picture the Shenandoah Valley. Then we have Massanutten Mountain. It's this long mountain that runs from Strasbourg, Harrisonburg. The one place that you can take an army over Massanutten Mountain is Newmarket Gap. Massanutten Mountain forms another smaller valley within the overall Shenandoah Valley. There's lots of little valleys once you get into the valley. Anyway, Luray Valley is formed by Massanutten Mountain to the west and the Blue Ridge Mountains on the east. It had been used very effectively by General Stonewall Jackson in the 1862 Valley Campaign. He had got part of his force up there. They raced down and surprised Union troops at Front Royal. This was the type of thing that Siegel wanted to avoid. So he starts sending cavalry out in various directions. He sends Boyd and these 300 men from the 1st New York Lincoln Cavalry into Luray Valley. Boyd and his cavalrymen have a rather uneventful trip. They do some foraging in Front Royal, have a confrontation with some civilians in the area, then they head farther south in the valley. They destroy some Confederate supplies that have been stockpiled near Luray, and then they keep heading on. They think they're going to cross over, join Siegel via Newmarket Gap. When I was doing research on the Newmarket campaign, I wanted to see the gap from its east side. So I actually planned one of my trips and one of my journeys into Newmarket so that I could come through Luray Valley. So I'd like to take just a moment and show you what it looks like in modern times. And you can try to picture what it might have looked like to these Union troopers as they're taking a look at the gap, the place where they're headed, and I will also include a picture of the old roadbed that they would have used as they wind their way up Massanutten Mountain to the top of the gap. So enjoy the photos and we'll continue with the lecture in just a moment. Context is everything when we're talking about history. And sometimes context means understanding topography and how 
land changes. Maybe the land doesn't change, but maybe the things on the land change. You see, there's been research that has been done by local historians in the Newmarket area, and it's pointing toward the idea or the fact that the top of Massanutten Mountain was probably treeless or bare in 1864. And that's really important because if you're up at Newmarket Gap today, there's trees. And you start wondering, how did they have this wonderful, clear view from a horse? How were they seeing all of this so easily? Well, if there weren't as many trees at the top of the mountain, that can make a difference in their view. What we know for certain is Colonel Boyd gets to the top of Newmarket Gap. He can look west. He can see the Shenandoah Valley from here. And he has a very beautiful view of the region. But he also has some very interesting developments that he is starting to observe. He can see what looks like a military force and maybe a military supply train moving down in the valley. Boyd wants to think it's Franz Siegel. That Siegel has left the Strasbourg Woodstock area and has made it this far in the valley. Boyd's other officers aren't convinced. They know Siegel will not have a supply train out in front of his army, and to them, it just does not seem logical that Siegel would have moved his army that far in two days, so far that they are only seeing the tail end of his army, or these supply wagons. To them, it's just not adding up. These Union Cavalry officers can also see military units down at the base of Massanutten Mountain, in between the mountain and the town of Newmarket. They're hopeful that it's Union troops, that they'll be rejoining their army, rejoining their comrades, all will be well. They'll have a successful report to bring to Seagull. They encountered no major Confederate resistance in Luray Valley. However, the other officers had some concerns. The concerns and the logic raised by his subordinates makes Boyd a little skeptical. He decides to send down a scouting party. He gives in. Fine, we'll send the scouts. Go down and see if those military units are Union or Confederate. So the scouting party heads down the western side of Massanutten Mountain toward Newmarket. They don't get very far. They get to the bottom of the mountain. And they find out, uh-oh, it's not our friends down here. It's some Confederates. In fact, it's Confederate cavalry that had spotted Boyd's cavalry column up at the top of Newmarket Gap. They formed quickly and came out and were waiting. A welcoming committee. Well, it was a welcoming committee with guns. So... Maybe not such a welcoming committee. The point of it is, there were Confederates down there. The scouting party finds out. They turn around to go back up the mountain to let Boyd know, you probably don't want to bring your column of about 300 guys down here. But Boyd was already on his way down the mountain. It's not going to be easy to turn around a column of horses once you're on this mountain road. They continue down the mountain to where the Confederates are waiting. Yep, Boyd brings down his whole Union Cavalry column. And it's near the bridge at Smith's Creek that the Confederates open fire on the Cavalry column. The Confederate units that were present at this skirmish were the 23rd Virginia Cavalry, the 18th Virginia Cavalry, McClanahan's battery, so you have artillery coming into this situation. Artillery against horsemen is not a good situation. And Chrisman's Boy Company, which was a militia unit formed of young teenagers. They fight off this Union Cavalry Column. The Cavalry Column really doesn't have a chance to maneuver. They try to fight back. It's not working out so well. They take heavy, heavy losses. 
Eventually, the surviving Union cavalrymen decide to make a dash up Massanutten Mountain. The lower part of the slopes were still wooded, so they're trying to get into the woods, make an escape, but it's steep, it's rocky, it's heavily wooded, it is not a good situation. Boyd's cavalry column gets wrecked. That also means that he is not able to effectively carry a message to Franz Siegel. Boyd's men are going to wander on Massanutten Mountain for some hours before they are able to rejoin Siegel and the army. Meanwhile, Siegel, the majority of his Union men, were still waiting at Woodstock. Woodstock, Virginia is approximately 21 miles north of Newmarket. It's on May 14th, the day after Boyd's cavalry fiasco, that Siegel decides to move out part of his army. He sends Major Timothy Quinn and part of the 1st New York Veteran Cavalry ahead. They're going to see if they can drive back some of Imboden's Confederate cavalry units that have been in the area. He sends infantry to support this cavalry advance. And those infantry units are going to be under the command of Colonel Augustus Moore. Now, Moore was the first infantry brigade commander in Siegel's army, but Siegel does something really weird. He plays regiment shuffleboard, if you will. He takes units that are not in Moore's brigade, and he puts them under Moore's command. He takes units that were in Moore's brigade and says, oh, by the way, you're going to wait in Woodstock with me. He does this very strange thing. Changing your commander like that on troops when they're heading into a conflict situation is less than ideal. No one has decisively determined what prompted Siegel to take this action. A probable theory that has been raised is that maybe Siegel trusted more as a fellow German American more than he trusted Joseph Thoburn. So he takes these units, puts them under Moore's command, sends Moore as the advance. It's a pretty good guess and there's a good chance that's reality, but we just don't know for certain. Colonel Moore sets off following this cavalry advance and he takes the 1st West Virginia Regiment, the 34th Massachusetts, and then later the 123rd Ohio is going to join him on this march. So he takes about one-third of Siegel's army, approximately 2,300 men, and he's setting off objective, not sure, but he's supposed to probe and help to fight in Bowdoin and find out if Breckenridge and the rest of the Confederate army has arrived. Moore and his men move through the small villages along the Valley Pike. It's near the town of Edinburgh where they encounter the remnants of Colonel Boyd's column. They hear that there is cavalry in force in the Newmarket area. Moore and his men press onward. They reach Mount Jackson, which is the town just north of the crossing of the Shenandoah River at this point in the valley. They go ahead and cross on the single wooden bridge over the valley. Again, they have cavalry with them. They're heading forward. Now, from where they cross the river, there at Mount Jackson, there is a mile, an approximate mile, of open ground. It is flat. I think it's flatter than flat. Um, somebody could probably prove to me that there's elevation out there, but it is a flat piece of land. And at the end of the mile, at the southern end of the mile, is this hill that rises. It's called Rude's Hill. Rude's Hill overlooks this flat land which is known as Meme's Bottom. There's fighting that happens in this area. The Confederate cavalry, they're skirmishing. They don't want to allow a Union force to just march unopposed up the Valley Pike. So there's fighting that happens along the flatland, along Rude's Hill. Imboden and his cavalry are not able to hold on to Rude's Hill. That frustrates Imboden, it concerns him. It's one of the things that he's going to talk to Breckenridge about. He feels that he abandoned an important defensive position. The Union column with more advances farther. They're going to move from Rude's Hill farther south toward the town of Newmarket. 
Meanwhile, they are rapidly increasing the distance between this third of the Union Army and Siegel, who is still waiting at Woodstock with the rest of the force. This is not a good situation to be in. Breckinridge was concerned about dividing his army, leaving part of it in the southwestern part of Tennessee to hold off against that um, other Union advance, and then bringing part of it to meet Siegel. Siegel doesn't really seem to think twice about dividing his army this way. Moore and his regiments have managed to cover approximately 20 miles between Woodstock and Newmarket. He has artillery with him as the Confederates make a determined stand along Shirley's Hill and forming a line south of the town of Newmarket. Moore brings his artillery into play. There's a heavy skirmish that occurs the evening of May 14, 1864. This skirmishing helps to set up what will be the battle lines the following day. Moore and his men will eventually take position on Manor's Hill. The Confederates will hold Shirley's Hill. As darkness falls, Moore sends messages back down the Valley Pike to Siegel, letting him know the enemy has been encountered. It doesn't look like Breckenridge is up yet, but the enemy's making a stand at Newmarket. John and Bowden heads up the Valley Pike to meet with Breckenridge. He lets him know that they weren't able to hold Rude's Hill. There's a defensive line that he left one of his subordinates holding near Newmarket. And Breckenridge inquires about the ground, wants to know if it can be used defensively. When Imboden says yes, Breckenridge makes the decision to move his army to Newmarket and see if a battle will be fought there. From soldiers' journals and reports from letters and post-war remembrances, we know that there was some skirmishing that happened in the night. Um, this is going to be the night of May 14th going into the 15th. Um, you have enemy soldiers facing each other across a small hollow, a valley, if you will, and they're a little on edge. They have their picket lines out. We know that there was some firing, some skirmishing that erupted in the night. Then it dies down and it's a bit quiet. They're waiting to see if reinforcements will arrive for both sides and what will unfold the next day. So, why did I drag you through this history? Because I think it's important to look closely at how the armies moved, which we did in our video last week, and then a little more specifically in these opening maneuvers of the Battle of Newmarket. May 15th is the official battle date at Newmarket. However, I find that it's important to understand what happened in that area on May 13th and 14th. You see, on the 13th, the Confederates proved that they held the area, that they had a strong cavalry force in place. They managed to, in some ways, surprise, but definitely drive off 300 Union cavalrymen, or thereabouts, under Colonel William Boyd. That's important. They're in force, they're ready to make a stand. Part of that is because they know Breckenridge and a few thousand infantry are on their way. Siegel is not going to get to march through the Shenandoah Valley, only opposed by cavalry any longer. May 14th is important because Siegel sends this detachment under Colonel Moore ahead, far ahead of the army. He wants to see what's happening out in his front. But the question is, was he ready for what Moore found? And part of that question would be answered in the battle on the following day. Siegel's army is divided and it's even strung out over this approximately 21 miles of Valley Pike. During the night, he sends another regiment that is supposed to join Moore at Newmarket. That's going to be the 18th Connecticut. So you have them halfway between, if you will. And you have Moore who's setting up a position on Manor's Hill. It will be the initial battle position for the Union Army. You have cavalry commanders that are establishing a Confederate position, a defensive position, on Shirley's Hill. 
the lines are being drawn, it would become a question of who could bring their force to the field and what would they do with their army when they got it there. The opening fights on May 13th and 14th in the area of New Market set up the battle which unfolded on May 15th. You can't have a complete understanding of the May 15th conflict unless you understand the situation that Siegel has had with part of his cavalry, with his army strung out. You can't completely understand May 15th unless you know that the Confederate cavalry has been delaying the Union army, that they are helping to hold on to a position that is ready for Breckinridge and his infantry to arrive and help take over. Now we are ready to talk about the Battle of Newmarket. I know I spent a lot of videos getting to this point where we're actually going to talk about what happened on May 15th, 1864. But don't worry, I am not going to talk about or teach about this battle in just one video. We're actually going to break the battle down into phases, down into incidents, and talk about those in video segments. So, our armies are at Newmarket. It's night, or early, early morning on May 15th, 1864. The battle is going to happen, and come back next week and we will talk about the opening shots between the troops on Manor's Hill and Shirley's Hill. If you want to see that video the moment it releases, subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you think, oh my goodness, I can't wait and I need even more details than Sarah is teaching in these videos, I have good news for you. My nonfiction history book, Call Out the Cadets, which is part of the Emerging Civil War series published by Savas Beatty, is available. I have been on book tour these last few weeks, and I would love to send you a signed copy of the book. You can place orders through Gazette 665 and even let me know how you would like that book signed. I'll put a link in the description for the video, and I, if you are as interested in this battle as I am, I think you're going to really enjoy the book. There are lots of pictures, there's even more detail than I can go into in these discussions, and thanks so much for watching and being enthusiastic or interested in the Civil War battle and its history. I hope you have a wonderful and inspired week, and we'll see you next time to talk about the battle. Thanks so much, and that's all. Bye-bye.